Ooh, benching on the squat bar, yeah. What's that? You said, am I benching on the squat bar? Oh. Maybe. I can't really tell. It feels like the thicker diameter. I don't care that much. I just want credit for my extra 10 pounds, you know? <laughs> yeah. Other than it being some kind of sacrilege to bench with a squat bar. Yeah. So I'm sure I'm committing some sort of right. lifting sin. But it's okay. That happens. We're going to say yeah. Yeah. We're going to say yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. a power bar, dude. Or a squat bar. <laughs> An extra 10 pounds on that for sure. <laughs> so this is a velo it's a device that measures the bar speed. It used to be Tendo used to make them and they cost a lot of money and they've come down considerably over the last several years. So you can use that to figure out how hard, like how hard a set is relative to your maximum. If you know how slow the maximum attempt will go, then, you know, assuming you're pushing as hard as you can, the faster it goes, the the easier it is. You know? It's a pretty straightforward concept, but when you can measure it, it's uh, it's kind of nice. It you can estimate estimate your 1RMs, uh, dial in weight selections for the day, uh, essentially just be a little bit more precise with things, which is nice. Hesitancy to get better in the first couple sets. Patterns that you pick up and then they change. I mean, that tells me that, you know, the last rep was 0.25 meters per second. So I could compare that to what I did last week and so on uh, pretty directly. But the pattern that I've noticed is that uh, on bench, especially for me, for the first couple sets, it gets a little better uh, for the first three sets or so, which take advantage of that. But then in, I don't know, maybe a couple months, that'll change and right. try to pick up a different pattern. And that's something that I think about this is that so much of it is kind of based on just trying to observe the patterns and mm -hmm. capitalize on what you see too, because a lot of people will see things that work uh, but then there's this moment of pause where you go, is that okay? Should I, should I do that thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you see it and it works, then go with it. Mm -hmm. The, I mean, I understand where it comes from, but there's like this, uh, asking permission kind of thing that happens a lot of times with, uh, more intermediate level types of lifters, you know, you see it with, if you ever write a program and put it out there, you know, hey, can I swap this exercise with that exercise? What's your program? Do what you, want? you know, I mean, that's not, they're not saying exactly what they mean. Uh, they're asking whether I think it's a good idea. And I get that. But uh, still, if you think it's a good idea, then it's probably worth looking into at least, you know. Yeah. And, and especially like once you've observed that you have this effect, like, hey, my bench is always better when I do close grip bench or add bands or something like that for some of the accessory work. And yeah, go with that. Yeah, they feel like they failed the program, yeah. but it's not, it's not a thing. The program works for you, you know? <laughs> like, it, if the, if you and the program were in, like, a, a work relationship, you're the boss, the program is the, the worker. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the other way around. So you don't really fail the program, the program fails you in some way. Mm 
And that's why I think programs have to be it's best when they're tailored to fit the, the individual. And it's kind of a big part of well, how I think about training, I think. Yeah. See if it's any better this time around. If not, we'll blame it on the squat box, right? <laughs> A little better. So there was another rep there, but I can see that, it, I mean, you can see that it was slower, but you can also measure that it was slower. And you can also tell that the fifth rep was a tiny bit faster. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> my down sets are gonna be fours, but I've gotta decide whether or not I wanna give it another go and maybe it gets a little bit better, uh, or just go to directly to the fours now. Um, the little decisions do add up, mm -hmm. but there's lots of little decisions, and then that'll lead to other decisions down the road and adjustments and stuff like that. So you just, I think a lot of it comes down to decision making and trying to you know, put the right weight on the bar, lift it the right number of times, keep my training log on my phone as well. So it makes it pretty easy to kind of go back and compare past sessions and whatnot. Sure. So when you look exactly at the thing, you know, I don't know, I keep a lot of details in the log that I make. Mm -hmm. Like I'm doing incline bench, well, a 30 degree incline or a 45 degree incline because there's a big difference. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. I guess you can take that too far, but you can definitely take it too far. But sure. I don't think, I think there's some big details that are not that. You know? Yeah. Last week was 315 for six reps. Last rep was 0.28. This is 10 pounds heavier, but the last rep was quite a bit slower. So, I mean, we can run that through a formula and try to tease out like, which performance was actually better. Mm -hmm. How much does it matter for something like this? And today, probably not much. It's fun to do if you like the numbers though. Yeah, I mean, to some extent it's important to capture that, but to try to do it in as reliable a way as you can. It's like, I'm sure you've heard people say before, like uh, how you feel is a lie, you know? And I always thought like, what a silly thing to say. You know, like, I think what they mean, I get the meaning that, you know, you shouldn't always run with the first interpretation of whatever feeling pops up, you know, and how you feel is a lie is a great catchphrase for that. But the literal interpretation of it is not, not the way, you know. Yeah. If you feel how you feel, it just may not mean exactly what you think it means. Especially guys that have been at this for a while will say, man, uh, if I only trained when I felt good, I'd never train. Like, well, yeah, okay, so feeling bad doesn't necessarily mean don't train, but like feeling really terrible or way worse than normal still might not mean that, but it might be worth paying attention to, you know, and it's a signal. Yeah. Yeah. It's all the, uh, the events leading up to this are so not far. Yeah, the externalities of it. Yeah, yeah. but then I think too sometimes then uh, what you would then typically be focused on uh -huh. is like mm -hmm. uh, alter. Yeah. And then that is for some folks a positive, you know. Definitely, definitely. I, 
I've noticed that like as a competitor that like, I train usually by myself in my basement. You get used to that. And then after a while you start going, well, you branch out and you go to a gym where there's other people, maybe other people watching you lift. And it's just a different stimulus. And it's a different challenge to get the same kind of focus that you always get in a different environment, yeah. you know? But, and I would imagine it's the same, but opposite the other way, you know, if you're used to training in, you know, a crowded commercial space and then you go to somebody's basement gym and there's not that same energy, well, that's something else to get used to. I don't know, that's something I find myself saying a lot though, like, what are you gonna do, not train? You know, like, yeah, you got something going on. You get, you know, what are you gonna do? Not train? Well, I guess so yeah. for some people. Yeah, I yeah. can't can't relate. Yeah. <laughs> Yesterday I trained at a YMCA. You know, it's got the <laughs> did some squats, and when I go to walk out the squats, you know, the rack height isn't right. The rack is like half on a stall mat, but not completely. Oh, no. So there's like this weird step and the bar is too narrow for the rack. So there's a lot of extra steps and stuff. But what are you gonna do? You're gonna, well, we'll just skip squats today. Like, well, that seems like a not ideal answer. Uh, I thought it was. Yeah. Felt worse than the bar speed indicated, which lots of times I'll go with like, my own perceptions first. Because, like I mentioned, like how you feel is not a lie. It really, really did exist. <laughs> you know, like I felt like that was more difficult, and like I would have rated that like an eight RPE, I think. So that's how it felt in the moment. Uh, and that could have been for good reasons or not good reasons, but that really is how it was, you know. So then I get up and look at the bar speed. It indicates, hey, that was actually better than eight RPE. Bar speed would indicate more like seven RPE. So I just take that into account and adjust a little bit. Uh, I try not to throw out any one thing completely. Now, if you really wanted to go the extra mile, uh, you could mix in video with it. But I mean, for incline bench, probably not that important, but if you're doing your main sets of your competition lift, maybe it's more important then. And even at that, I'll try to keep the RPE around an eight. Now it just has to do with the type of protocol I'm doing in this block. Sure. You can do it so many different ways. You can drop the weight or not drop the weight. Drop the reps a little, drop the reps a lot. Keep everything the same and let the RPE go up. You know, yeah. uh, percentage based or RPE based. There's, I think a lot of people, it's like my system gets kind of uh, typecast into the RPE system, but I mean, it, to me, that's just a tool to be used. And like any tool, it's well suited for some tasks, but not others. Mm -hmm. So understanding that and applying it appropriately is the way to go. And it's like to give you an example, it's better better suited for the harder kinds of sets, higher RPE work, because it's easier to tell the difference between an RPE nine and RPE ten than you know low RPE work, the difference between a five and a six, say. Uh, and the consequences are a lot more important too. You know, the recovery cost of being wrong is is bigger, uh, and the risk is higher and the impact on a lifter's psychology is bigger too. It, 
we have a set that is supposed to be maybe maybe RPE eight. So like it's going to be a tough set, but not a killer, right? But then you do it, and it's a ten that has a downstream impact on that lifter's psychology. And I mean, at that point, it varies so much from person to person, but it's still something to be uh, to be managed. You can pretty much tell by how it feels, but it's also nice to have uh, an outside observation too. Lots of lots of folks will get that from a training partner, which is beneficial as well because then you can look at technique. And I mean that's another thing too, right? Uh, the details of that stuff will matter. And I like think there's a bit of expectation too, like for, for training partners, you know what your training partner is trying to do, how it ought to be. So there's a little bit of an anchoring to that, like even if you don't mean for there to be. Yeah. 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 We're talking about the conversation with Dave and his training partners. Can you imagine those guys like rating each other's RPE back in the day? Yeah. It would not have been a system that would work. Yeah. <laughs> Especially because they're all trying to like out Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> the, the incentives are not aligned at that point, right? Yeah. Well, for for this, <laughs> for the RPE stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Enough of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a 0.29, so very slightly slower. There's a few different ways to do it, but you can build a chart that will kind of correlate the bar speed with reps in reserve or RPE, something like that. And you can either do that by just collecting some data over time and you know mapping it out, or uh, you can do a, a diagnostic for it. Uh, like what I've done before for, say, a bench press, take your 1RM and then, um, see, I think it was 85% and 70% and do an AMRAP set with each of those. And you can spread it out if you want or, or not. But you take the bar speed and you'll notice that your your last rep before missing is pretty much the same velocity. And then one rep in reserve is uh, another velocity. And then it kind of backs off from there. And you can kind of form this table. So that's 0.29. You can look it up in the table and kind of estimate how many reps in reserve. It's a little bit of, a little bit of effort, but that's fairly stable, you know, for a couple of years probably. So, uh, big reward for a small time investment. 